<laughs> Who's this guy? He's a great looking guy, isn't he? Um, this is my, uh, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but this is uh, when I did an earlier video about the theory of everything, because I'm a big brain. Um, so what this guy's talking about <laughs> is um, where you may be able to, the, the problem with um, the uh, the way that physics is, and I'm not going to say, you know, all the, the cliche stuff, like, you know, the reconciliation of quantum physics and um, uh, uh, relativity, which, the, the, in essence, you have two theories that describe the way things work, okay? And you got relativity. This guy's talking about... Um, <laughs> uh, is it is it there's something mentally wrong with you if you talk about yourself as if they're another person or is it just talking in third person so uh, you know coffee physics I've already drunk it okay I just drunk it so anyway it doesn't matter it's just a gimmick anyway um, he's talking about I'm talking about obviously in the video uh, about the theory of everything now it's it's kind of theory of everything is kind of a cliche theory of everything well they're talking about basically they're talking about um, the fact that the the two dominant um, theories of how um, physics works how how the world works essentially uh, there's two dominating theories and one's quantum physics and the other one's um, uh, relativity and they both work in their own realm and they allow you to make predictions essentially because that's why you have the theories it allows you to make predictions and understand how things work how mechanisms work and stuff like that they both work because they both describe what they see they match with the observations in the domain that they're uh, at, um, talking about so you have uh, relativity which describes how planets and, and, and ast uh, astronomical bodies work and how you know we perceive things as well honestly um, it kind of gets a bit grey when you talk about our experience <clears throat> but not uh, not that it's outside of our experience because um, you know you use sat nav don't you sat nav has compensation for uh, the uh, both um, um, special relativity and and, and general rel and uh, yeah general relativity um, there's compensation for both in the way the satellites work because they're involved with time and specifically because they're very very sensitive they they let me stop it because that's distracting isn't it um, they're talking about they have to compensate for the fact that the satellite is flying over the earth at speed um, uh, it's a geostationary I believe they're all geostationary the sat satellites are all geostationary because that's how they work and so they're transmitting basically w the way it, the way it works right is they're, sat they're transmitting their position and the time you see an accurate clock time right and so that means that, that the, the, uh, your sat nav picks up the, the satellite its position in the sky and also the time that it transmitted you see um, and because uh, obviously it travels at the speed of light so it's like you know you get the signal you know whatever 100 milliseconds later or something like that and it compensates for that in the but it's about relative positioning that's the thing yes yes that's it you see so what it is is you've got like say three satellites and they're all transmitting where they are and the time that they transmitted and when you receive it on your sat nav it goes right that one's further away that one's a bit nearer and that one's uh, somewhere in between based on the time they receive the signals that's how essentially gps works it's getting the relative times of all the satellites and then saying you know and this is like nanoseconds i guess level and so that's how and that's how they get that and the accuracy has been increasing because they get better at actually having accuracy of the clock so they're now down to like picosecond, I don't know. And that's how they can get more accurate positioning. Yeah? That's how they work. But the clocks that are actually in those satellites need to compensate um, for uh, both um, special relativity because they're 
travelling at speed because they're at a radius of a bike 38 miles or something I think it is uh, away from the Earth uh, in order to have a geostationary orbit so they're synchronised with the the, um, the the timing of the Earth and uh, also because of general relativity because they're in the presence of Earth's gravity but they're actually distant from the Earth if they're in geostationary orbit they're actually distant from the Earth a few radiuses I think like about 10 um, and so they're actually a little bit further out and, and out, slightly outside of the, uh, the Earth's gravity well which affects how the clock works because of the way that time dilation works you know we here on, ex on Earth experience time slower than the satellite does so it has to compensate for that in the clock you see and they put you know they're, they're in touch with these things obviously and they upload firmware and every so often they obviously calculate the uh, the actual time that's passed and then they compensate for both GR and SR because they know how fast it's traveling so they can calculate the compensation for SR and they also know how far they are away from the earth so they know how far outside the gravity well they are and so they can compensate for GR so the maths for relativity gives us a solution for those satellites yeah and they use that to compensate for the clock drift which used to happen before they actually realized that it was because of relative relativistic effects right so we know obviously you don't know on a daily basis but the thing the technology that you're using uses relativity right uh, to compensate for the clock drift and also you also know because I don't know chances are well you're obviously on an electronic device usually a phone nowadays isn't it right and these these guys use transistors inside them and those transistors work because of quantum effects uh, the way a transistor works is that it uses the quantum effect to actually control the signal across the transistor so this device that you're looking at uses both relativity and quantum mechanics you see so the very fact that we are using these things means that they obviously work the science works because that's how these devices work so there's no denying it do you know what I mean but then do you have the two theories and I've been studying them and going through um, um, Leonard Susskind's lectures because they're posted Stanford posted their le the lectures and so I've been uh, dealing with those and oh, it's mental the maths is mental uh, Einstein's uh, field field equations I think it's called I can't remember yeah it's basically where so what you're doing is you're compensating for the shape of the universe essentially around around a massive body you have to reshape the way that the universe is to actually you know that's how the field equations work um, it's you, you've all seen these things where they chuck balls on rubber sheets and stuff like that well the way that I th and I don't know for sure because this is I mean people have been doing these for decades do you know what I mean and I'm just picking it up now in about 10 minutes but um, what they're doing is they're basically saying right okay so you have the sheet which is flat okay Cartesian coordinates it's a flat sheet all right it's a uh, metaphor for the universe it's a two-dimensional but the using the universe is three-dimensional but we, we gotta we gotta somehow visualize it we'll somehow get a mental picture of this thing so we use 2d we use flat sheets okay to represent the universe right and then you, you poke a hole in it like that right and then you use uh, Einstein's field equations I believe and I don't know for sure but I think this is how it works you use the field equations to actually show the contour in in the uh, in the sheet as if it were right which gives you then the ability to calculate a trajectory of a particle going around this sheet now the reason why it's um, and it's all like you know tensors and metrics and stuff like this and um, I think a metric basically is a matrix it's a matrix right which is a grid it's like a, a spreadsheet if you like that's a matrix so it's like a spreadsheet but it's not just you know like width and height you can have a multi-dimensional matrix you can have a 10 dimensional matrix if you want to but it's not easy to draw <laughs> but you can have it uh, and then you have tensors now I believe basically tensor is 
doing a function on a matrix to change the matrix's data. That's a tensor, I think. It's really, really difficult to try and understand it, but I'm guessing that's what it is. So you have uh, a metric, which is the matrix, a, a spreadsheet, right? And then you have a tensor, which is like a macro, <laughs> if you like. You know what I mean? And so you're then applying the, 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 the distortion to that data, right? So you're running the macro on the spreadsheet, <laughs> and, and and it changes the data, and it changes the data on the sp on the, it changes the <laughs> right. So quantum physics all about Excel. <laughs> running running <laughs> running VB in, Mac in Excel. No, not at all. Of course, um, it's the nearest I can think of. Do you know what I mean? Um, and uh, given that this computer is actually running Linux, so why I'm talking about Microsoft Excel, I don't know. <laughs> but if I was talking about LibreOffice Libre Calc, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. So yeah, everybody talks about it. Anyway, yeah. So <laughs> let's back to the point. So that's what the, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, that's what the field equations are about. It's about um, applying a change to a multi-dimensional uh, database of uh, calculations sort of right and so you apply the uh, you apply the tensor to the the metric and that then gives you a mapping if you like so you can say right okay so if it's Cartesian which basically means it's all rigid and square right and then you apply a transformation and then it becomes distorted like you have a gravity well in there and it tells you what the geodesics right geodesic is like a, a path that you would naturally follow geodesic on the earth if you walk around the earth you follow the geodesic on the earth right if you just walk in a straight line right or roll roll a ball as if it were if the earth was a completely smooth ball and you put a ball on it like that right and, and there was no we're not actually in the you know what i mean it was just normal earth <laughs> yeah, yeah. A normal like there's an abnormal earth <laughs> anyway um so you put a ball in you push it and it'll just continue rolling around Okay, we're assuming this is actual planet that's just been smoothed right down. You put a ball on it, you push it, and it follows a geodesic. And it's the same when you're talking about you have the ball in space and you got your um, so you got your uh, star here and you got your ball <clears throat> and it will travel towards the star. Now what it's doing is it's following a geodesic in space time. It's actually following a path because that's the path it would take through time and if you was if it was possible to wind the clock backwards then it would come out during uh, using that geodesic as well it goes forward and backwards over that geodesic it's like it's a path that's cut through space time and and this is what the field equations actually calculate what is that geodesic what is that path okay i believe now like i say i'm still trying to get this stuff and it's pretty heady stuff obviously um because I need to understand the relativity part of it, I've already done the mechanic, the the quantum mechanics part of it. Because we had um, uh, Mr. Binney's lectures from Oxford University, and he published all. He's got twenty five lectures on how quantum physics work, including all the maths, you know, about potential wells and all this sort of stuff. And I've done all that, studied all that stuff, and I, you know, Hamiltonian and all that sort of stuff, you know. And I understand, and about uh, you know the. the potentials and stuff like that so i kind of get that and the maths of it as well and now i'm looking at the the maths of einstein's field equations for the relativity part of it right so that means that then if i can do that if i can understand the maths of the i might have to go back and revisit it, it was a while ago since i looked at those lectures and i've slept since then and uh, so i might need to go back and look at those and and, and do a, a quick you know just quick 10 minute refresh on quantum mechanics <laughs> <laughs> like you can have a 10 minute reef anyway um and then once i've got these uh the field equations understood i'm not saying i could do them do you know what i mean but i just understand how they're, d how they're calculated and the same thing with the uh the wave functions and stuff i'm doing um um <clears throat> what's it called um it's amplitude isn't it it's the amplitude you're calculating probability amplitudes basically aren't you now the thing is, when you go into it with quantum mechanics and they show all these wiggly lines and saying, "Yeah, I need to," but the real the, the reality is, is that a lot of these actual wave functions, the actual wave function itself, is relatively simple. It's like simple harmonic motion or something like that. Yeah, 
So while they show you all these complex, like look at the wave functions, like those jugged, it's probably a sine wave or something like that, or just a single path. Most of the times, that's what they are, right? When you're actually you're following the trajectory of an actual particle. Now there's one for you, and I think this is where the overlap's going to occur because they're talking now about uh, what is it? Quantum field theory. That is something which I kind of spotted a long time ago, and I'm talking about a decade ago. And it's like they took when I, when I first knew about and and with, I I first learned about Young double slit, and it was like, is it a particle or is it a wave? And I'm thinking, well, this is a natural system, right? And whatever it is, that is inherently what it is. How we describe it, what language you use to describe that thing, is down to the fact that we're stupid and we can't work out what it is. It's not that. It is those things. It isn't a particle and a wave. It's the fact that we don't understand how to conceptualise it. Because we think of particles as... I don't know. No, I haven't got anything. That's a particle. Whatever, you know what I mean? It's a pair of Bluetooth here. But, but it's a thing. It's a solid. It has an edge to it. Right? Now, a particle in quantum physics obviously isn't that big. <laughs> you know, because we're using particles right here... <laughs> you know, and there's a million of them just on my fingertip there. No. So it's like they're talking about like balls, right? Because when you say particle, you think of it as being a very, very tiny ball, right? Fine. That's a particle. The description is a point mass, right? <clears throat> and you have um, the the wave obviously we can see particles we can see things we can see solid stuff like that and we can see waves you go out and look at the water because i'm actually in land so i can't do that but you know what i mean you can watch a video of the water oh, i've got youtube here look at this um but you know what i mean a wave on water so we see the wave on the water and we can play with that and we can make it do certain things right in the macroscopic world that we exist in and we can also chuck balls at things and stuff like that and fire bullets and all sorts of things. So we can conceptualise that. But when we get to the quantum world, we have something which is basically both. And I'm like, well, it's not, obviously, a particle. It's just that's the bit that we see the effect at. This is just a big um, space, a field, and that bit there is where we see things changing. So we see that and we say, oh, particle. But it's actually, it's like a room full of smoke, right? You're in a room full of smoke, right? And some guy's smoking in the room. And you can see the guy smoking because you can see the smoke coming out of his mouth. You can't see anything else, just the smoke. The room's, you know, I'm mean, talking about, you know, right? That's what we're thinking we're seeing, right? We're looking at that. We're looking at the smoke and saying, look, particle. And it's like, well, no, it's everywhere. It's just that's the bit where it's having the effect, yeah, so that's that's what I think, actually, and that's what I thought at the time. I'm talking about a decade ago. I thought, well, that's probably what's happening. It's actually everywhere. It's 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 working like a wave because it's actually some kind of universal field, universal thing, like a room, you know, a universe full of smoke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but we're looking at the smoker. We're looking at where the smoke's coming out and filling the room. And and so that that's what I thought. I thought there you go. And now here we have quantum field theory, where they say, "Oh look, yes, it's a field." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> but the reality is, is that they don't publish these things immediately. So they may have thought that at the time and just thought, "Well, yeah, but you know, how can we do the maths on that?" And so recently they brought out a field theory, <clears throat> QFT, which then describes it using Feynman diagrams and stuff like that, and they're doing the interactions and all this sort of stuff. So I kind of I got that then. And this is just the maths based, the basic maths of that, uh, that they're thrashing out now. And I think that's the way. And there is kind of, to me, there's a noticeable overlap between that, where you've got universal fields, yes, and, um, but there, there's this thing about energy potentials. So you've got the universal field, and then you've got the Higgs field, right? Which is, oh, crikey, how do you describe the Higgs field? Man. Um, it's a bit like you are on a sheet, right, where you can just run around as much as you want. That's like an electron field or something like run around all you want as well as that. And underneath it, you've got this Higgs field, right? And what happens is in order for you to be real, as if it were you're, you're a real particle, you have to basically push your finger through 
into the fit the Higgs field below right and so that means it's going to drag the field isn't it you're going to sheet it's a sheet you know what I mean you put your field you put your finger through the electron sheet into the Higgs sheet and then it pokes out and it's like whoa and then you put it oh how much it? it's like treacle do you know what I mean that's how that's how we get mass that's how it works I think now these are complicated subjects and you're talking about things that you can't see with the naked eye you can't even see it with a microscope you know i mean it's it's just as invisible right all you can do is detect the presence of these things from a secondary effect you know you have electron microscopes electron microscopes use electrons electrons are quantum particles right so how do you measure something that's smaller than an electron like a, you know or or you know in that sort of magnitude when you're using an electron to measure it do you know what i mean it's not easy so you're looking for the after you're looking for the so it's understandable why these people have problems with this and you know they want to come out with three it's fine and people criticize them like me some daft bastard comes on tv onto a youtube channel and goes ah oh, yeah you're stupid you don't know anything well neither do you so shut up you know wind your neck in however saying all that i can you know quite happily say that I have the ability to try and understand these things just as the scientists do. I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer. But I can understand these things the way the way that scientists do and I can speculate on what a solution might be, which is what they do. It's called a hypothesis, right? And so I can speculate on a solution. And I think there's something in there where we're using... This guy here is talking about where we we've got this relativistic thing going on in wires about electromagnetism, yeah? And... Uh, <coughs> excuse me and um but also you have this thing where you got this relativistic effect of time causing gravity essentially that's what it is they're saying that it's the mass that distorts the uh it distorts the um uh it's it's almost like you've got a wave going through yeah this is the nearest thing right so you've got, you know, you have a wave, you have water going down a, a tube, right? And you stick something in it and it kind of goes around it, doesn't it? it, got, it you can see it going and you put, you put confetti in and it, it kind of moves in, doesn't it? And then you have the vacuoles afterwards and stuff like that. It's the same thing, right? Where you have the mass which disturbs the passage of the time. That's how it works. But they don't see how that occurs. And I think there's some sort of an overlap with what's going on with that Higgs field thing where you know like the Higgs presence of a Higgs field makes mass appear present right doesn't it and then you got this thing where you got this drag you put something you put a mass into the Higgs field perhaps and maybe that causes the Higgs field to do that thing that you see when you see you know like vacuoles appear past a post in in water I think it's something like that I think that's what when we see gravity that's what it is it's the, that the mass causing that and that's the time dilation thing which then causes what we see as gravity. So gravity isn't a force, it is just an effect. Yeah? And the the thing that's in the, the Higgs field, right? Obviously we're talking about something very small, so you'd need a lot of them. Do you know what I mean? In other words, like a planet. A lot of mass, a lot of these quantum particles, billions of these quantum particles, they're all in the presence of the Higgs field. And they're causing that to distort the time. To me, that's what it is. I think that's what it is. And so that might be the reason why. But the trouble is, is they can't they can't measure these things because they're so big and small. Like you know, we're talking about something that that that's that's smaller than a quark. You know, and you know a quark's small, don't you? Because you've seen one. No, <laughs> you haven't. Nobody has. So. I'm thinking that's it's something about that. It's something about the way the Higgs field works, where it causes the presence of mass, and it is distorting the the flow of time, as in space time, such that it causes that. And obviously, if it's a very very small particle, you're not going to see that effect, are you? It'll be quantized. In other words, that you put that in there, and it'll cause a channel which will just stay like that. But if you have a bunch of them, then it'll quantize in, won't it? It'll, it even though it's quantized, it will look like it's a a, a, a flow inwards, a smooth flow inwards, because you've got a billion quantum particles all 
you know, in presence of the Higgs field, and they're causing this what appears to be a smooth uh, tapering down, which causes the curvature of the uh, space time. Maybe. But one won't because you just put that in there and it'll just create a channel. Like you're sticking your finger into um, sand. Somebody, you know, you put your finger in sand like that and it just forms a channel, doesn't it? So you don't see it at quantum level because the quantization of it means you can't see it because it doesn't appear. But at a macroscopic scale, yes, it will. And I think that's something to do with it. But I don't know. And that means I need to get into the maths, which means I need to do these things that mathematicians do and that's have a breakdown or something I don't know so I need to have a breakdown in order to work it out I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding watch this space because I think there's something in it <laughs> me I'm in it <laughs> okay right but seriously I'm gonna try and see if I can get my head around all that stuff because I think that's where it is I think that's where the answer to the big question is Graham saw the answer <laughs> well, I saw the thing about QFT 10 years ago, so maybe, I don't know. It wasn't exactly manifesting in that way, but I was on the right track. And eh, I guess physicists were as well, but they just, they, they, they wanted to make sure that they get it right before they tell people, which is fine. As an engineer, I can understand that. I don't tell my clients that I've solved a problem until I really know I've solved it. You know what I mean? Because you all tell them, they all get excited, and you think, oh, shh, now it's not solved. Now I have to tell them, no, I was lying. So you can't do that, can you? You have to make sure you're right before you tell your client that because they go and then start spending money, don't they? And if they spend the money and they're wrong, you're the one that gets sacked. I might not put that in the video. <laughs> anyway, let's see what happens. Watch this space, eh?